My name is Bill Scott. I head up UI engineering here at PayPal, and uh, the man who needs no introductions is about to come up, Doug Crockford. Uh, I think one of the highlights of my career was actually sharing a cube, a large cube, thankfully, for Doug, with Doug Crockford. Uh, I don't know if I got any smarter, but I sure had a good time uh, sharing the cube with him. And uh, I tweeted a little bit ago, because today was also Python Day here at PayPal in the same room. Yeah, come on, Python guys. I tweeted a little bit ago that uh, Guido by day, Croc by night, right? Because Guido was here, the founder of Python. Uh, and then uh, we have Doug here tonight. And then Brendan Eich, uh, who's the creator of JavaScript, just sent me a tweet, said, what, am I chopped liver? <laughs> so Brendan's a little jealous tonight. We'll feel a little sorry for him. Send your thoughts his way as we let Doug Crockford come and speak. Thank you, Doug. Good evening, friends. Welcome to PayPal. I never thought I'd say that. But, <laughs> but I'm very happy to say that tonight. Thank you all very much for coming. So um, I have two topics for you tonight. Um, the first one is programming style. Programming style sometimes thought of as the part of the program that the compiler ignores. Um, so for filling in all the white space and the comments and all that other stuff, you're pretty much free to do anything you want that one style is as good as another, because it doesn't matter, it's ignored. I'm gonna to try to convince you tonight that that's not true, that style is critically important, and some styles are profoundly better than others, and I'll try to convince you of that tonight. The other topic is your brain. Now you might wonder, what do brains have to do with programming style? How can these concepts possibly be linked? They're, it turns out there is a connection, and it's a really interesting and meaningful connection. Um, so let's start with that. Tonight I'm going to be um, misrepresenting the work of Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel winning psychologist. Now, Nobel does not award a prize for psychology, so they gave him the award in economics. But he's a, a psychologist. Um, what, but what he did was he found that one of the fundamental assumptions of economics doesn't hold. Um, and that is that any party can be expected to pursue its own best interests. Kahneman found that this is not necessarily the case if the party is a human being. Because it turns out people do not think the way economists think they think. And in fact, we don't think the way most of us think we think either. Um, in fact, the more you study Kahneman, the more surprised you are that we can never get anything done. So, um, he came up with a, a, a metaphor, a model, of how we think involving two systems. System, system two is the high order analytical algorithmic system. It's where we do um, logic and mathematics and reasoning. Um, and it requires a lot of effort and it's pretty slow. And it's because it is so slow we had to invent computers because our brains, our system twos, aren't fast enough to do all the math that we need. And sometimes it's called the head. You know, it's, it's where we think we are when we think about where we are and who we are. Um, then there's system one, which is heuristic. It's associative. Um, it's very, very fast. It knows nothing about math. Um, and it cannot be turned off. Now, we've always had the sense that we had two things going on. You know, you could think of system two as being the head and system one as being the gut. You know, and you're always saying things like, well, my head tells me one thing, but my gut tells me something else. You know, what, what should I do? So that's not news. What's news is what Kahneman found about the way that they interact. That um, the system one um, is very fast because it's able to substitute a very simple solution for a very difficult solution. So it, it will swap algorithms, and sometimes it gets incorrect results doing that. And it provides the working set for system two. And system two is not aware that it has done that. So as you know, if you have a logical system and you have false premises, you can get false conclusions. And it turns out that's how we work. So um, this may sound a little impossible. So let me show you an example. This comes from visual processing. Visual processing is the opposite of computer graphics. 
It's where you take a signal from a camera and you study all of the pixels and you try to determine what all the objects are in the scene and how they're all moving relative to each other and the camera. This turns out to be really, really hard. It requires enormous computation. Um, and somehow, we're able to do it with no effort at all. And the evolutionary value of being able to do that is obvious, right? You're being chased through the jungle by the saber cat, and you got to move really fast, and you don't have time to do the full algorithmic solution of, that finds a path through the forest and avoids tripping over roots and running into trees. We're really good at that. Um, so uh, let me, but we make mistakes. So this is an optical illusion. Um, it was designed by Edward Adelson of MIT. Here we've got a, a checkerboard with white squares and black squares, and there's a cylinder on it that's casting a shadow, and two of the squares are labeled. Now it turns out square A and B are exactly the same color. Okay, you put this image in Photoshop and you, you put the drop on both of those squares, you get exactly the same value. Um, to prove that, um, I'll just drop a, a rectangle on there. That's a solid colored rectangle. You can see there's no discontinuity there. They are the same color. Some of you may be seeing a gradient. There is no gradient. That square is a solid color. So if you put your hand up and you cover up square B, okay, the gradient disappears. That block becomes a solid color. And when you drop your hand, the gradient reappears. Your brain is lying to you. <laughs> okay, system two knows the truth of this. It's done the experiment, and it heard me tell you, and it knows that it's true. And yet, you cannot stop system one from lying to you. There, so you will deny the evidence of your eyes. You will deny factual data in order to remain con consistent. And in some ways, that's a really good thing. Um, if a computer system becomes inconsistent, it's likely to fall over. But we're, when we're being chased through the jungle, we can't afford to fall over. So we have to do, uh, we have to somehow resolve the inconsistency so we don't go insane or, or freeze up. And so we've got systems which are trying to reconcile uh, things that are not in agreement. And sometimes that forces us to accept things that are not true as true. Um, now this was, um, a, a, you know, Kahneman's findings about how system two and system one work were quite surprising and shocking, but it turns out it was not a surprise to the advertising industry because they've known this stuff all along. They found a way to construct messages that target exactly to the gut, bypassing the head, convincing us that we desperately need things that we really don't need. And, it, you, know, and you can see it in things like pricing, that um, something that is $1.99, we perceive as a much better deal than something that's $2.01. It's because the gut is going, wow, that, that's so, and it, it gets, it puts remarkably bad weights on those things. Now, nobody understood this better than the tobacco industry. T tobacco should be a really difficult product to sell, right? Because um, you look at, what does tobacco do? It makes you smell bad. <laughs> it turns your teeth yellow. It makes, it makes you sick, and then it kills you. <laughs> so how do you convince people, yeah, I want to try that? <laughs> You're not selling to the head. You're selling to the gut, because the gut can be confused about things, um, because the gut can't do arithmetic. Um, so the gut will confuse slow death with good for you. Uh, now, if you ask a smoker, why do you smoke? If he were completely rational, he'd go, I smoke. God, that's right. That's stupid. I should stop right away. Uh, but that's not what they do. Um, you know, they'll, they'll start rationalizing. So system two has been informed by system one. There's not a problem with this, so there must be a good reason to figure it out. Um, so it'll, he'll try to figure it out. Um, you know, like, um, you know, I really enjoy the taste of burning plant matter 20 times a day. You know, that, that, that's something I need. Um, and you might imagine, it makes me more popular. And he, he can be saying that while he's sitting in a restaurant where all of the 
healthy, good-smelling people are trying to get away from him because they don't want the, his stink on their food, yeah, it's making me popular. You know, so it's sort of like the optical illusion thing. We will ignore evidence of the real world in order to conform um, our biases. So that's the brain we have, and that's the brain we need to use to write computer programs. And it's hard, because computer programs are the most complicated things that humans make. There's nothing else that we construct that is made up of more parts that are fitted together more intricately, which have to work in time and logic um, for unexpected inputs, and it's really hard. Um, and from the very, very beginning of programming, it was recognized it was too hard. Um, so there was a, a lot of interest in artificial intelligence. Um, the promise of AI was that the computers could write the programs for us um, because they're just too hard to write. Um, so, you know, we'd say, computer, write a program that does something, and, go, Bloop. and then we could say, now write a program that's smarter than you. <laughs> and keep doing that until you become our overlords. <laughs> well, that didn't work. Um, AI is, is really hard. Now, AI has accomplished some useful things, like it can play a really good game of chess now. You know, when in the early days of AI, they looked around and said, well, what can smart people do that stupid people can't? Go, well, we play chess, so the, there's been a lot of work on writing chess programs. So we now have chess programs that play really good chess, but they have, they're totally incompetent at all other fields of endeavor. There's no generalization of that intelligence to other matters. Um, so, you know, we've had those successes, but you can't give a set of requirements and a list of customer interviews to a program and say, okay, write the application. They can't do that. But um, computers are good at translating one formal language into another. And that turns out to be a useful tool to have when we're writing programs. And that's reflected in our programming languages. And we've made tre tremendous progress in the design of programming languages. You know, in every generation, um, we can, you know, double our ability to deal with the complexity of the stuff that we have to do. Um, so uh, programming languages are, the, uh, are uh, profoundly important because it turns out the amount of code that you can write in a day is pretty much independent of the language that you're writing in. So the more expressive your language, the more you can accomplish. So uh, languages are useful. So the thing that makes programming so, so hard is the need for perfection. The program has to be perfect in every aspect for all possible inputs, for all time. And if it is not perfect in any way, the computer has license to do the worst possible thing at the worst possible time. And it's not even the computer's fault. Whose fault is it? It's your fault. <laughs> you get the call. Why isn't this working? Why did you screw this up? Um, so you'd think with, with that, um, we would never release software until it was perfect. But we can't do that because we don't know what perfect is. We have no way of recognizing it, even if it occurred and we're pretty confident it has never occurred. But if it did, we just wouldn't know it. So instead, we ship it as is and hope that we'll find whatever's wrong with it before anybody else does. That's kind of nuts, but that's the state of the art. That's the best we figured out to do. Um, and that's as good as it gets because we are hunters and gatherers. And I don't mean that metaphorically. There's been no human evolution, at least since the Ice Age. So we were selected for surviving in that time. And it's kind of amazing that given, you know, there was nothing in hunting and gathering which prepared us for computer programming. But somehow we're able to do it anyway. And that's kind of a mystery. Um, so programming obviously uses system two, right? We're keeping a lot of stuff in the head we're keeping variables and logic and relationships and all of that, and we're, we're, you know, that's obviously a factor. But I think the gut's involved in it too, because we cannot articulate how we do programming. 
there's not an algorithm you can write down and give to someone else and say, this is how you write a program. That doesn't exist. Somehow we all figure it out. You know, so a, a rule book which says, well, first you go top down and do all this stuff, and then you go bottom up and do that part. But no, you know, then we'll go inside out and outside in, macro, micro, we're scattering all over. We look at the problem from all sorts of different directions, um, large components, small components, putting it all together until, boom, finally the solution occurs. And we do not know how we do that, and we cannot describe how we do that. Um, but I suspect there's something about the interaction with the gut which provides those flashes of insight um, and the suggestions of when it's time to change view, which makes the whole thing possible that if it were not for the gut, programming would not be possible. I have absolutely no evidence to support that statement. <laughs> but my gut tells me it's true, so I believe it. <laughs> and that's sort of the problem, because programming is all about trade-offs. Um, there's never a, an obvious way which is going to be correct for all situations going forward. So we're constantly having to guess an estimate and say, well, probably time is more important here or space is more important there. And very often we're relying on our gut to help us make those decisions, and the gut is very flawed. And so very often we'll make the wrong trade-offs. But that seems to be better than doing nothing or waiting for a perfect model, because often that doesn't occur until long after the project is done. Um, so. I'm going to be giving you some examples tonight in JavaScript, but the theory that I'm going to uh, be recommending can apply to any programming language, and in fact does apply to all programming languages. It turns out that all languages have good parts, and all languages have bad parts. It just happens that JavaScript has some of the best good parts ever put into a programming language. I continue to be impressed um, and astonished at the brilliance that is in JavaScript. And at the same time, it has more bad parts than any other programming language. And I'm constantly frustrated and angry at the stupidity in some of the language. It, uh, it, it's the result of a language designed by a really smart guy who was only given 10 days to design and implement the language. Um, so it's amazing how much he got right in that time. And it's not surprising how much he got wrong in that time. So because of all of the bad parts in the language, and it's profoundly bad, I don't trust myself to write in the language because it is so easy to go off the rails. And a lot of people are suspicious of the language and don't want to use it because it is so full of traps and hazards. Uh, so to help me to, to write here, I wrote a program called JSLint. JSLint is written in JavaScript. It reads my JavaScript programs. And it tells me when I'm near those, those bad parts and that helps me to uh, be better. So everything I write goes through JSLint. Before the first time I try to run it, I'll have JSLint take a look at it and tell me, you know, is it good or bad? Um, and if it tells me it's bad, I go and, and repair it before I try to run it. Um, and I, I found it so useful for me, I released it to the wild because I thought it might be useful for you. So uh, you should be using JSLint. If you're not, there is something wrong with you and your code. 